do with Salvaterra pottery, and I noticed that there's really not many videos out there about casting a two-part mold for the ram press. And um, I figure that's probably, the, or the reason why that is, is because it's such a very long process. So um, I'm going to cast this piece here, and of course this is added on, this little loop. Uh, is added on after the piece is pressed. So um, to start the process, I threw a model, which is this white part, and I bisked it. And then I painted it with a white glossy paint because you want to seal your bisque. Um, it can't be porous. So it was then painted. And then you, I put, um, you have to soap it so the ceramical does not stick to your piece while it is um, while you're casting it. So here is the soap that I use, and um, I will put the information on how to get this on in the comments. So I've been casting for probably about 10 years, by no means am I the best caster, or I still even consider myself a beginner, but I can teach you the basics of doing it. So I took this piece, it's upside down, it has clay stuffed in it completely, it has to be completely supported and filled inside this piece. And then I threw this section here and I create what I call the cutting edge and a gutter, which is right here, and this is where the excess clay uh, goes and creates back pressure. And there's a little spot right in here that's gonna be very, very thin. And that is where the clay breaks off when you're pressing um, your piece. So the first section you do in this two-part mold is you do um, the male, what I call the male piece. And so this is about ready to go. The, you can see where the soap is still a little wet. So I usually soap it up real good several times. And then I stick it in front of a fan between every uh, generation. So I'm gonna go stick this back in front of the fan to get the soap to dry off. And I can feel that it's, it is uh, soapy. And let me just show you what you do to soap. So I take a sponge and you just take the soap and you run it all along your piece and all along anywhere that the plaster is gonna sit. And I already put two thick layers on that part, so I'm not gonna soap that up again because it's still drying. But um, you wanna put probably three or four layers of soap because the last thing you want your, to do is your plaster to stick to your model because then after all this work, uh, uh, just setting up the mold, it's, you lose a lot of time and a lot of material. So I'm going to put this back in front of the fan to dry and I'll be back in a minute. I use Ceramical to cast. Um, there is another material that some people use, but Ceramical is what I was taught to use. You use two and a half times the Ceramical to one part water. So I have my Ceramical measured out. And this is 17.8 pounds of ceramical. And then I'm going to measure out my water. You want your water to be um, around 72 degrees. So right now it is about 70, 72 degrees in the studio. And so I'm feeling good about starting with 72 degrees of water. If it was 60 degrees in the studio, I would actually up the temperature of my water to maybe like 80 degrees um, because my ceramical is going to be colder than that because the my, want my mix to ultimately start at about 72 degrees. So you compensate by making your water cooler or hotter. Okay, so I'm going to mix in a five gallon bucket and I have a cup here. This bucket I use only for ceramical. You never ever ever want to get your ceramical and your clay or your chemicals um, touching one 
one another. So I always use this bucket for casting. It is my, my ceramic towel bucket, and I never would mix glaze up in that. Okay, so I have my scale here, and I'm going to set it to zero to take into account my weight of my bucket. So if I hit tear, okay, now it's set at zero. And I'm getting water in here and working at getting the temperature right at about 72. So I am using a thermometer here that was intended for uh, like cooking turkeys and that kind of thing because it's quite accurate. And we're just trying to, I've got the water too warm, so I'm working here to get cooler water to pass with. Okay, so my model this is really good now. The soap is dry on it, and I'm going to set it on this spot where I cast. And so there's my model. Here is the first half of my mold, and I'm going to stick it down over my model. And I want this to get nice and centered because the second half requires for this to be centered the way I have it set up. So I'm going to take a minute. It doesn't have to be perfectly centered, but you want to come close. A little bit on. Oh, no, that's stuck. So I'm not a perfectionist, and you have to put on your perfectionist cap when you are going to make molds. Uh, so this has always been a stretch for me because I really um, am not a perfectionist. Okay, so this is setting over my mold. I'm going to check and see how my tubing is going around my model. And I'm going to just adjust it a little bit and push it down closer. Okay, I'm feeling quite good about that. I think my model is centered in there nicely. So if I just pour plaster in this right now, it's going to leak. But I need to put clay all around the edges of that where the bottom um, touches the side of the model. So let's get that going. And this is just purge pugged clay. And I'm going to go all around the edges and stick this down. So this clay, once it comes off this mold, goes straight into the trash can. It's going to have plaster in it. You can't use it to really make anything else. And it's not even easy to use if you're going to reuse it again for casting. You might just throw it out and start over again. So here I am sticking clay all around the edges. So I know I am going to miss a lot of steps. So you could not take this video and just go, you know, go for it as far as making a mold for a ram press. But it'll be a good overview for you to see if you want to get into this process. It is a very steep learning curve to do this um, and so that's the reason I thought I would show part of it um, you know people who are critical about people who use a ram press for mold making if they really knew the art in mold making and all the steps I don't think they would be near as critical because it really is an art and there is a lot to learn just um, by doing it on your own. So if you think this is the way you want to go, find somebody who already does this, that's what we did, and work with them um, to learn how to do it. And that's what we did. We found somebody local who was already ram pressing, and out of the goodness of their heart, they taught us everything. Well, not everything, because can't make up for experience, but they taught us a lot of what we needed to know to make molds. Okay, so I think I've got that all um, 
stuff down and hopefully it won't leak. And now I'm just filling the holes for the registries, the registers, or whatever they call it, so the two molds come back together. So you need a very hefty air compressor. We have a very large air compressor in the studio. And um, I had a smaller air compressor and it would give out on me partially way through the purging process and talk about scrambling for uh, uh, to try to get a mold to not set up while you're trying to figure out, oh my gosh, what do we do? That was not good. So make sure you have a good air compressor and I'm going to turn my air down to zero. Okay, we are set. We are set up getting ready to pour. The next thing I want to do is see how level we are because you want all this to be level or your um, mold's not going to be level and you're going to crack your mold if your mold's not level. So let me pull my level out, see how we're doing here. This is my first, oh man, dead on. Let's say this way. Okay, we are a little high. I'm going to get a shim on that side. So what I usually do is I stick a shim under my bucket. And see how we're looking. Okay. Let me go a little higher on this list. Yeah, okay. So we're level. There we go. All right, other things I need to do to set up. I need to have a little cup. I need to have steel wool. I'm going to set my scale back because I don't need that at the moment. I need a timer. The next thing we're going to do is we are going to call, uh, slake the plaster into the water. So you always add plaster into the water or ceramic cow, excuse me. I call it plaster, but it's ceramic cow. So we add that, if you shake it in there slowly and let the water uh, or the plaster absorb the water. Let me come back. Okay, so I have my drill. Um, this mixer I use only, only, only for when I am mixing up molds. And because again, it's got the ceramic cow on it. Okay, so my mixer is ready to go. And I like to take a block and stick it under my water bucket. And I also like to get a piece of cardboard because it likes to slash up. So let me go. How did I know how much plaster to use? You measure your die ring. You measure the diameter of your die ring and the depth of your die ring. And I have a formula paper to um, figure out exactly how much I need of plaster. So I will make sure I put that up there, up uh, under comments also. Okay, so we are going to slake in this plaster into the water. And then I'm going to mix seven minutes of fast churning um, of the ceramic cow water. And now I'm going to slow it down and mix another five minutes just kind of keeping it rolling um, and then it comes to feel as far as the ceramic cow. So let's let me show you slaking. I'm going to change the camera a little bit. All right so slaking. Here's the, the ceramic cow I measured out. Here's my water at the right temperature. Slaking means sprinkling in your ceramic cow. So once you get at this point um, there, you need to be all hands on deck and can't get interruptions because the next half an hour you are tied down to this mold completely. So here's the slaking and I'm just sprinkling it in the water and letting the water slowly absorb the ceramic cow. And then um, I'll start mixing and I'm not going to leave the video running for 12 minutes while I'm mixing, but I'll start it so you can see what I mean. And then I'll show, I'll, we'll turn the camera back on. 
after uh, after I got it mixed up. So I'm here in the studio by myself today, and I'm taking a chance that hopefully nobody will show up while I'm doing this. Usually I like to do this um, while I've got somebody else here at the studio, so if customers come in or something, um, they can handle the customer. Like I said, there is a no return for about half an hour. And I, I do think she needs to uh, be in here and supervise. Okay, we're starting to get to the bottom of our chicken. So, what I like to see is like a checks and balance is when I get close to the end of putting my ceramic cow in the water, I want to see it kind of sitting on the top um, not absorbing in, which means to me, okay, we measured really well. All right, there is our plaster. I'm going to set my timer for seven minutes. mixing pretty fast. I'm going to put the box over top like this so it doesn't splash up on me too much and I'll come back to you once we are uh, got it mixed up. All right so I have mixed this seven minutes fast and five minutes slow and now we are waiting for this mixture to get a certain consistency. You don't want to pour too early. Um, you pour too early, you get what I call geysers, um, and it's just an area where all the air just shoots out of uh, out of the mold, and I hate it when it happens. And I've had several lately, so um, I'm going to. I always like to pour a little on the late side, and I'm just waiting for this to get to the consistency. So. After you do all that timing, you just kind of mix and mix and mix slowly and keep it moving with your hands until you get the consistency that you want. And I will try to show you what that consistency looks at. So things start really moving quickly um, uh, once we get rolling here. So, and of course, I had a customer come in right in the middle of timing this, and I just kept mixing with, uh, slowly with um, a whisk, which in small batches I can do that, in large batches when we're doing really, really big molds, um, that really would not be an, a good option, but um, that's what we have to do sometimes. So uh, I was actually quarantined for two weeks and just it got back into the studio and so my staff had to cover for me while I was gone, and they're taking a day off today because uh, they've had to cover so much at the studio while I was in quarantine. But So hopefully um, we can get back to normal um, next, in the next couple of days, um, and everybody can have a little break from the studio and be ready to go again. And uh, it ended up my husband and I didn't end up getting COVID, we, but he did get directly exposed, which put me exposed to him. And so we quarantined just to be safe. But anyway, so it, you can see where it's getting thick and it's running off my fingers, but it's still not quite the consistency I like when I uh, pour. So I'm just going to wait until it is um, ready to go um, there. Sometimes I don't, I just do my seven minutes and my five minutes and we are ready to pour. And then a lot of times I'm honestly just mixing a little longer like I'm doing right now, waiting for the consistency to get where I want. And we're getting there. Like I said, I don't want to pour early because what happens if you get what I call this geyser, the air that you're trying to inject into your mold all goes out this geyser hole 
And so then you don't get good air in your mold and you need good air in your mold. So when you're using the mold to press, it releases well. And if you don't have good air, that mold doesn't release and you spent a day plus of work doing all this and planning for this and guess what you're going to make that mold all over again and let me tell you it happens um, all part of the learning process so dry okay we are starting to get where i want so i'm going to see if i can show you what i am looking for i'm looking for me being able to see my fingers drag a little bit and I could slowly see my fingers dragging um, in this and the weight is getting like where I like it so we are we are getting there this is uh, coming a little slower than um, a lot of times but I have learned my lesson about pouring too early let me tell you so, and I always try, it seems like I always err a little too early and I'm not gonna do that this time. I'm gonna try to get it just right. And Ivy thinks she needs to be in here helping. But now you can see how much thicker it is, how it's rolling off my hands and it is feeling heavy, but it was much runnier beforehand. Okay, so I am liking that. All right, so here we go. We're going to pour our ceramic cow in our mold. And I basically pour it right um, down on the center. So here it goes. And it's nice and thick, so we should have a good cast. And hopefully, it will not leak when I'm pouring this in. So I always want extra ceramic cow. I want it to go over the top. There we go. I have plenty of extra. It's my first time casting this particular mold, so I got more extra than what I really like. I'm scooping a great big cup of the ceramic cow, and I'm putting my thermometer in there. So let me turn this around a little bit. Okay, so here's a cup of ceramic cow. I'm putting my thermometer in and I'm seeing what our starting point is. And I said we wanted to be at about 72 and we're going up a little bit and we are at 75. So we're three degrees higher than our goal, but that's not too bad. So, bad. so this is setting up, like I said, I'm gonna start moving kind of quickly here. I want to be able to reuse this bucket, so I'm watering down the, the extra ceramic towel real quick in my bucket so I could use it again. Okay, so we were at 75 plus 23, 75, 85, 95, 98 is where we'll start injecting air. All right. This is starting to set up pretty nicely, and I'm going to do something new this time that I don't, I haven't done before. So I'm going to get a straight edge, my straight edge across this mold and get off this excess ceramic cow. All right, and it's setting up quite nicely already. Now I had these made, and I have two sizes, and they're really heavy platens is what I call it. And so I'm squeegee this platen down because we want a really smooth edge on this mold. And I'm actually gonna run that straight edge across there one more time and knock down my platen because if this isn't level, it will break on the it'll break on the press. Okay, so squeegee, 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 back and forth, back and forth. Okay, I think we are level. All right, let's see what temperature. 
we're at? 82. We've got a little bit of time to go yet. All right, so we are at 97 degrees. So we're waiting for it to go up one more degree. Um, here is my thermometer in my cup. There it is at 97. We're waiting for 98. And then more action begins. And what we will be doing is we will start with 10 pounds pressure. Okay, it just hit 99. So skip. I'm gonna put short on triple A batteries. Okay, here we go. First 30 seconds, 10 pounds. Good gracious. We're gonna do 10 pounds of pressure. So I have a gauge here that I can control the amount of air pressure I'm putting into my mold. So we're counting down 30 seconds, and after the 30 seconds is over, I will um, put it up another 10 pounds of pressure. Okay, we're at 30. 10 more pounds of pressure. Bumping it up to 20 pounds. All right. So at about 30 pounds of pressure, you will start seeing water coming out of this mold. And that's when I'm gonna start taking um, this excess stuff off the mold, like the platen and the clay around the edge and that kind of thing. So um, this we just keep an eye on our gauge to make sure we're staying at the poundage we want and we are watching the seconds go by and I don't think I'm gonna have a geyser so here's hoping not it basically a geyser looks like a, a hole that just goes deep down into your mold and like I said the water and the air all blows out of that geyser if you have a geyser and what it is is um, I think what it is, is uh, if you pour too soon, you've got too much uh, water content in there and it takes up the space and creates that little geyser. Okay, so we are at a minute and we're gonna go up to 30 pounds. Start the uh, timer again. We're at 30 pounds. Let's see if we start getting some water coming. Yep, I'm seeing it starting to drip down the edges here. So, I think we'll let it, yep, right on time. Now if you can see it, but there, there is, there's water. You can see the water dripping. Let's see if we can get our platen. Yep, there goes our platen. All right, he is looking good. I see no geyser. I am happy with that. I'm gonna start scraping off the excess plaster. Got a little bit of water. Yeah, this is looking like a nice flat mold to me. All right, 46 seconds. I'm gonna start taking off this excess clay that I had to put around here to keep our mold from leaking. All right, time for another 10 pound pressure. Okay, 40 pound pressure, here we go. Okay, there's 40 pounds. Let's finish getting this excess clay from away from our mold. And this just all goes straight into the trash. Because it's got plaster and all kinds of stuff in it. And throw that out. Okay, so we are ready to lift this off of our model. Let's see how we do. Here it comes. Perfect. All right, that's about as good as it gets, ladies and gentlemen. Sometimes my model sticks into my mold and um, that is not something you want, but eventually the air pressure blows it out, but it may mean that you have an undercut 
in your mold. Okay, we're ready for another 10 pounds of pressure. Okay, so we are at 50, and I see that some of the paint kind of came off of my um, model here. I'm not sure why. Probably because I used two different kinds of paint, because I started with spray paint, and I wasn't happy with it, and then I went to latex. But So here is my steel wool, and I'm going to ever so gently um, rub my mold a little bit. It's still kind of soft. And so I can like clean it up if there's any bumps. I'm getting that little bit of paint off of it. And this looks like it's hot steam, but it's warm, but it's not, it's not hot. And we're just getting started on the uh, purging process. So this actually gets quite interesting looking. So let me... around now you're starting to see what it looks like let's see where we are ah okay ten another set another one minute okay we're up to 60 pounds pressure and looking good so i'm going to move the model out of the way because we need to reuse that on the inside the opposite side and we are just gonna go crazy here. So this is a little mold. Uh, I would highly suggest when you start doing this, start with a little mold. My first mold actually was a tiny little cabinetry mold um, knob. That's what we started with because we got to deal with um, um, selling knobs through Home Depot. And so I had to cast those knobs because we were making thousands of them. But okay, that is looking good. Looking good. Now watch in the seconds. And eventually I'm going to start adding some fresh water to this to start cleaning that mold out. Okay. We're at 70 pounds. Let me get the squirt bottle. setup because really I should have some kind of drainage sink underneath my mold and I do not have that going. We're, we have a plan to do that in the future but that has not happened yet. Okay, another minute's gone by believe it or not. We're at 80 pounds of pressure. So um, Nancy and Alan Stegall of Stegall Stoneware in Irwin, Tennessee are um, very good at this and they are the folks who taught us this process. So thank you, um, Nancy and Alan. They have been wonderful mentors to us over the years um, and they're my go-to people whenever I get stuck with anything and they have given and given and given um, time, knowledge, and love to Randy and I, um, not just with the mold making process, but just everything. And um, that's why I choose to share this with you because they show, so generously share this process with us. And, um, you know, we've got to pass this kind of work on to the next generation. So, that's what I'm doing through this video. Okay, now I've made this look a lot easier than it is. This has been probably one of the most problem-free molds I've made recently, and it just popped out perfectly, and 
I'm really, really pleased with it. So let's hope the second half casts as well. Oops, and I'm a 30 seconds over because I'm yapping too much, but that's okay. Um, here we go. So we're at 90 pounds pressure, um, but uh, so yeah, this, this cast has been perfect. So some of the things I've done, like when I first started, I hand through everything and um, I cast those things. And we only cast pieces that are really big production. So we get about 750 presses out of this mold and then we have to remake the mold again. Um, this little cup is something that we make tons of. And this is the second time I'm casting it this year. And, um, but majority of the work that we sell, we still, I still hand throw or we slump it. Um, but this piece, we, this piece gets cast and we probably have about 10 pieces that we actually cast and this is one of them. So I'm going to wipe it down a little bit. I got a little booger here, but it doesn't matter right there because it's on, it's not in the actual piece that we're pressing. So, all right. is looking really, really good. And let's go up to 100. going up um, to 120 pounds and then like I said I'm just going to let this thing what they call purge and it's going to purge for a couple hours until all this steam and this water that's dripping off is completely gone and then um, then I'll be ready to cast the second half of the mold which I will pick up with you at uh, that point so I'm gonna stop now because at this point we're just purging 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 um, and adding 10 pounds of pressure at every Monday. And here we go, we're going up to 110. And starting over with the... Okay, so this is Sue with Terra Pottery. I will probably cast the second half of this mold in a day or two, and I will start videotaping again. Thanks. So let's take a look at um, this mold. I am starting to cast the second part of this two-part mold for the ram press which is a 30 ton press at least i have a 30 ton press that uses air to release the uh, piece that you're casting so the first piece has been casted and it is um we're now casting the second piece on top of it. so this here is the first part that I've already cast, and this is the second part that I'm gonna cast. And the two die rings are put together and you put clay around it so uh, when you pour your ceramic cow in there, it does not leak. I have three points like this that I slide pins down in that go clear through to the second die ring. And that is so when you cast, everything is lined up and when you put the mold on the press, it is uh, lined up perfectly by those pins. And like I said, I have three of them. One on, here's a second one right there that I have a pin. Let's see if I can find it right there that I have a pin in. And here's a close up of the air coming in to the uh, second part of the mold. So let's take a look at the inside of the mold. There is my chicken wire that supports my air tubing. Here is air tubing that is plastic that I use to go. This part does not have um, air coming out of it. Only this part that looks like rope will have air coming out of all the different uh, pieces of this tubing and it's a special kind of tubing that releases air so you put 
the plastic out to the point where you don't want air and then when you want to start air that's where you tape I use electrical tape this uh, tubing in and all of the chicken wire is wired down to the frame nice and tight so it doesn't move and I have this white this uh, tubing going down into my mold that I'm casting so here's a wide shot of what it looks like set up and getting ready to pour it is leveled and we are going to pour ceramic out in that second half of that mold. All right, so I will be back with you in just a minute. We are on our second day of uh, mold making, our two-part mold for the ram press. And I've got my water over here measured out, my ceramic out measured out. It is one part water to two and a half times ceramic out. And the amount that you start with depends on the um, uh, area of your dye ring. So I had it figured out and I will put a sheet with the formulas up for you. And so this is very much like the first part. So I won't show as much detail, but I'm gonna start slaking my ceramic cow into my water. And then I'm gonna mix seven minutes fast, five minutes slow. And then we'll get to this point where we're trying to get the right consistency of the ceramic cow, which I showed you last time. Um, why do I go five minutes slow? When you go fast, you're really trying to churn and get everything broken up and really mix well. So that's why you go seven minutes fast. And then the five minutes slow is you want to give it time for the air to get, um, or the air bubbles to get out of your mix. So you just keep it churning slowly and trying not to introduce any more air but actually get a little bit of air out of it because you want a nice smooth pour so I'm going to take care of that and then I'll come back to you when we are uh, looking at consistency again of the ceramic cow once it is we are past our five slow minutes because that's a critical part so I'll be back with you in just a minute so I have done my seven minutes fast and I'm actually going to go to a whisk for my five minute slow just because the size of my container and my drill bit, it's um, putting a lot of air, but uh, just because I, I, my bucket's only this full, so it's putting some air into my mix. So I think I'm just gonna do it manually for five minutes. And um, you, know, you don't have to do it this way. If my bucket was fuller and my paddle was down slow, lower, or if I had a smaller paddle, I would uh, just, it would be easier to use the drill and just go slow. But basically, I just want to keep this plaster ceramic cow moving and let it do its chemical thing to get the thickness that I need. So that's what I'm doing here. I have my timer right here counting down for me for my five minutes. I'm trying to think what else I need to tell you while we're doing this. So let's talk about the die ring and the model. I would say if you want a good three inches on all sides bigger than the actual widest part of the piece that you are casting, because the more excess ceramic cow or mold that you have around there, the stronger your mold is gonna be. So um, you could all, I would say, error on bigger than smaller. And as far as height, I go have at least two inches of just pure ceramic cow before I start um, with where my mold starts in my dye ring. So those are some tips. These here phalanges are for me to tie down my die rings to the press. There are some different systems to do it. This is actually not my favorite because it's hard for the fabricator to get everything lined up just right and we have moved on to a different way of tying down our die rings to our press than this system. But uh, this is an older die ring that I have and so it's, it's a good die ring. I would suggest that you find a really good uh, fabricator 
to make your dye ring, somebody local that you can work with, give them very good drawings. The inside rebar, the support system is important, again, because you don't want your dye ring to flex. If you're using a 30 ton press, you can flex your dye ring pretty easily, and as soon as it flexes, your mold is cracked and you're gonna have issues with your piece releasing. Not that you can't continue to use a mold after it's cracked, but it it causes extra problems and you have more cleanup on your piece when you're releasing it out of the mold, if that indeed happens. So let's see, what else, what else? Um, you, when you get your dye rings fabricated for the first time, you will want to get a heavy duty platen, I call the platen, I don't know what, what it's actually called, made. And that is the part that a really heavy metal, very, very flat piece that you stick on top of your mold right after you pour it. So you will need that too. And that's why I say get a good fabricator because these pieces are just made custom for this process. Uh, let's see. Um, there is another press out there besides the RAM press. It's called a Kula. You will probably see some of those here and there. It is a very similar system. Um, Kula did not stay along real long, but people did love his press, love him. Um, he's no longer with us, but the people that I learned from actually learned from Kula and their presses are Kula's. So, but Ram is still around. They're out of my home state of Ohio, even though I live here in North Carolina. Okay, so that is my slow five minutes. And let's take a look and see. I think we are probably still too thin. Oh yeah, we're really, really thin. Okay, so I'm gonna try to get the camera so you can see what we are looking at here. You put it down a little bit and I'm gonna get ceramic cow on my iPad. All right, so here I go, I'm just, mixing and you can see how it's still very 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 watery so we're going to be hand mixing this for a while um i edited the first half of this so you didn't see how long i was in here and be bored to death with me mixing 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 with my hands waiting waiting for this to get the right thickness and i'm going to do that again this time and i will come back to you when we get to the consistency that I am looking for. So. All right, we're starting to get close to where this plaster needs to be. Um, and while we're getting close to, you can feel it really starting to change. Like I said, it starts feeling heavier. It looks different when I pull my hand out and when I drag my fingers across, I start to see drag marks. Um, I wanna to talk to you about my thought process when I got decided do I want a ram press or not and why I went this direction while well, I'm still stirring this. Um, so I never really ever wanted to get into mold. I had done one mold when I was in school and because of the detailed perfectionistic way that molds are required, it just wasn't my cup of tea. Um, but at one point my husband decided he wanted to come into the business and he was not going to be throwing pots. And so if he was going to come into the business and work with me, we had to find another way to produce quality pottery without the expertise of um, him using the wheel. And we had friends who were using the ram press. And so we started looking into the ram press process. So for most pieces, or I probably all pieces, I could throw it and alter it faster on the wheel than go through the whole pressing, cleaning, and the time into making the mold and the expense and everything. The reason um, you would, well, the main reason I think anybody would wanna get into ram pressing is if you need to start hiring staff, which I have, who don't have the expertise in throwing and you need to produce more work than what you personally can. And so an option is to go to casting because running the ram press is actually, doesn't take the skill that years and years of practice of um, 
learning how to throw and throw at a certain level. So, okay, I'm feeling pretty good at this, about this. Um, so, as I drag my fingers, I can kind of see the drag in here. And you can see how it's pulling on my hand and sticking um, to my hand more than it was originally. So, I would say we are pretty much ready to pour here. Um, a lot of times it's very quick from not wanting ready to pour and ready to pour. I think I could have got my water a little warmer to get to my optimal 72 degree mix. Um, and that probably would have made this step of the process a little faster. Okay, so we're gonna pour our ceramic cow in straight in the middle. Nice even pour and fill it up. And hopefully I have my clay nice and tight between the two die rings. Okay, you wanna pour a little over what you need and get a nice full cup that I always have set a little cup waiting um, because we have to find out what our starting temperature is of our ceramic cow that we poured. So there we are and there is my cup over there waiting and huh we well let's see it says 72 which says now 75 okay so we are starting at the exact same temperature that we started the last time our starting point is 75 degrees and i'm gonna let that set up just a little and in the meantime i don't want uh the extra ceramic cow and i got quite a bit of it setting in this bucket too long so i like to get water in it right away so this is my first time casting this piece in this particular mold, and I always err on too much ceramic cow and too little, because that always causes another problem if you didn't have enough ceramic cow mixed up. But I will make a note that this amount of ceramic cow is too much, so the next time I go cast, I will cut it a little shorter, and I'll keep doing that until I find the optimal amount of ceramic cow and water for this particular dye rig. All right, so we are starting, see how quickly that has gone from soupy to not soupy. And this is something I did for the very first time was uh, run a straight edge across here. And I really thought that that worked out well. So I am gonna run a straight edge and you can see the consistency of the ceramic cow coming off there, it's already pretty um pretty thick that quickly because you saw how it was when i poured it and there it is all right okay so i'm going to stick my platinum on that i have fabricated on here i'm squeegee it down because we want a perfect flat surface all right, so we started at 75 degrees. That means we're gonna start injecting air at 98 degrees. So I am gonna let the time go for a little bit. How long does it usually take to get up your 23 degrees? It's never exactly the same. I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes, sometimes longer, depending on a lot of variables. So I'm gonna go clean up my bucket clean out my drill bit. I do that outside. You never let ceramic cow or plaster anything go down your sink or your sink will be clogged and um, you would have to put in a new sink and pipes. All right, so we're at 98 or 90 degrees. We're waiting for 98 and here is my setup right there. Uh, see, it just went up to 91, and it's only been about five minutes since I turned off the uh, camera. And usually I keep myself busy with um, other cleanup things when I'm waiting for things like the temperature to change. So I use this exact same drill to, to uh, mix up my glazes, and while I'm waiting, one of the things I do is I wipe down my drill really, really well, cord and everything, because I don't want any ceramic cow 
um, to drop in my glaze buckets because that would be bad, bad, bad because you never want to mix any kind of saplaster or ceramic cow with your uh, clay. So it is getting all cleaned up. We're at 93. So let's talk about what I set up here. Um, this is a very well built with uh, two by fours uh, flat piece here. And then it has Formica on top of it. But I have actually seen a different setup that I think is even better. Somebody took um, marble or granite and it was a section, a scrap section from when somebody cuts out the area for a sink. And that is a nice, flat, very sturdy um, thing that you could cast off of instead of this. So I actually have some of that at home. I keep saying I'm going to bring it and I have not yet, but this over uh, time is starting to warp a little bit and show its wear with all the water and, and everything. So I would recommend um, that actually. And what I have underneath it is a great big bucket. And the reason I have that there is I usually run a grid across my bucket and then my flat, this flat piece over it. And that way the water and all the stuff can drip through. And, um, but lately I've just not, I've been foregoing the grid and just using towel to sop up all the water. So that's uh, not ideal system. We are at 97. I'm gonna put this drill away and then we'll probably be ready to start purging. And I usually jump from 97 to 99 for some reason. It just always happens, happens to be that way. So you always want to have all your things you need for making this mold already pulled out. I keep a container and all my mold stuff all together. So every time I'm going to make a mold, I just pull everything out and I'm ready to go. Yep, and we jumped right to 99. Okay, so because I only have one AAA battery right now, I've got to move it from. Okay, 30 seconds for the first 10 pounds of pressure. Here we go. All right. I'm gonna adjust the camera so you can see what we got going here. All right, got the timer going. If you don't like getting dirty, this is not the job for you because I don't know how you could possibly do this job without getting ceramic cow clay and everything else on you. Okay, so we are at 30 seconds. I'm gonna reset. And we're going to 20 pounds of pressure. So this is um, the exact same process as the first half, but I will go ahead and tape it because you never know I might say something that connects with you uh, the second time around, maybe that I didn't say the first time. Or sometimes it's just good to see um, the process repeat because it's uh, you know a good learning process. So um, I have talked a little bit about this geyser and I don't think we're gonna get it today, thank goodness, but um, the geyser is when there's just a big hole in your uh, mold that you just made at the top and so all the air and water spews out of it and that is just a bad thing but there's a way to work with it not ideal but of course we're always in problem solving mode when we are working with anything with clay and um, what people usually do is stick sticks in it because the wood will expand okay 10 more seconds or one more minute excuse me 10 more pounds Okay, our water is starting to come up already, which is good. It's really bubbling this time compared to last time. Um, awesome. So I'm going to take the flat notch, and it's coming off really nicely. Yeah, and you see maybe where I've got a little, couple little flaws, but no geyser, which is excellent. I'll come back to the thought of how you can resolve the geyser if you get it, because if you do this long enough, you're going to get a geyser. So, okay. I am taking off the clay that is around the spot where the two die rings come together. And that was so 
you put the clay around there so it doesn't leak when you pour in your plaster. And um, you want to get your die rings nice and clean with no plaster on them. So it's the plaster is still, I always say plaster, ceramic cow is still a little soft. So this is a great time to start cleaning off your die ring while you're waiting anyway for the next minute. And there we go. Now we're up to 40 pounds pressure. Okay, I'm going to pull this apart because you want to get it apart pretty early on. So here's hoping it comes apart nice and easily. Let's see. And I have sometimes fought with these. There we go. That is looking good from what I can see. All right. Move Ooh, that over. That's the other thing. These molds are heavy. And um, I don't want it to tip over, so I'm trying to see. Usually, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to push this mold this way and lean this mold against it. There we go. I like it to be set up sideways so the water can drain off. Okay, I forgot to set my timer, but we are probably at a minute, so. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna keep cleaning up the edges of this die ring. And then I'll talk about once you have a geyser, how you can resolve that problem. One of the things you can do, and I usually do, is I actually put soap, the releasing soap on my die ring too, all around the edges here. And that makes getting the ceramic cow off the edges of your die ring easier. So you'll need a couple of good scrapers when you do this process. Oh, the model's still on there. Look at that. Okay. <laughs> it's all white, so I didn't realize. Here's my model that just, I just, it just came out. All right. There we go. Ready for another 10 pounds. Okay, we're counting down. All right, so I'm gonna get some more of my steel wool. And I'm gonna just lightly go over my mold. And all I'm trying to do is, if there is a little uh, rough spot somewhere, it's uneven, I'm just smoothing it out because let's face it, if I'm gonna make 750 of these pieces or a thousand or whatever on this mold, every one, if it has a little spot in it, is gonna have that little spot in the piece that you're gonna to have to clean out. So um, let me go catch the phone real quick. The hazards of going taping and running it through the air. Salvatera Pottery. This is Sue. Yes. Yes. Yes, Amanda told me. We're out of quarantine. All is good. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. What can I say? That's uh, what it's like to be in the studio and be a business.
seven or eight. Hey, we got four seconds left before we have to go up again. So that's pretty good timing. So can't complain when the customer adds to their custom order. So there we go. Okay, one more minute. And I was working with, come on, here it is, my steel wheel. Oh, a little bit. Okay, so geysers. Um, so if you get a geyser, what I have really found that works great are chopsticks, wooden chopsticks. So you jam wooden chopsticks down in the hole of the geyser, as many of them as it requires. And what happens is the wood, ooh! Okay, hold on, let me get that back on there. I didn't have that on there tight, I guess. There we go. I'm surprised that was working as well as it was. I'm gonna slowly bring it back up. Okay, so you jam as many of those wooden chopsticks in your geyser as you possibly can do. And then um, it, uh, it will expand and fill up that hole. And that way you can get the air and the water coming back out of the areas that you want it to come out of. So um, that is a way that you resolve a geyser. Okay. Now, I have learned from experience that you have to be exactly perfect with this one minute and pound, you know, 10 pounds going up, 10 pounds going up. Because I've had all kinds of crazy things happen during this purging process, um, including, like I said, one of my air compressors just overheat and, and couldn't handle the amount of uh, air it had to create for the mold. And um, we had to scramble and buy uh, a baby portable air compressor to finish the process. And it probably took us Oh, probably 10 minutes to figure out that's what we wanted to do, hook it up and get it rolling. And actually that mold turned out just fine. So you will find, have a new problem with every mold I think you make. And every time I say, I have had every problem you could possibly fathom making, doing this, uh, this mold process, and yet I come up with a new problem. Like that popping off, I've never had one of those pop off before because I always stick it on and make sure it's tight. And so, out of all the times I've made a mold, I've never had one pop off like that, especially at 80 pounds of pressure. So, uh, you just got to be prepared for anything when you are mold making. Um, another problem I have had is when I go to pull these two molds apart, I couldn't get them apart. And I even had to get an assistant to come and we jam screwdrivers in between two molds and crank them apart just to get them up and out. This one released great, so um, it's making me look like I really know what I'm doing, but like I said, I've had more and more problems than you could possibly fathom with this uh, process. And you see all this steam and everything, and it looks like, oh my gosh, it's going to be boiling hot. It's not hot, it's barely warm. Um, so it's just, it's just deceiving that uh, it look, you know, that we're actually got a lot of heat going here. It is not hot at all. And I like to feel and see what kind of air I'm getting out. And like this mold here, I'm getting great air coming out exactly everywhere that I want it to come out. So this is turning out great. Great, great, great. Oh! And you might say, boy, this is just too much chaos for me. Yeah, it is kind of chaos. It's chaotic to, uh, do this whole process. So you could be up for it. It would be better if I wasn't here in the studio by myself. But it's a rainy Saturday and usually when it's a rainy Saturday very few people come in and we get, get very few calls. But uh, and I started before we opened this morning to get through the, um, the most critical parts of the mold making process. So, But that is looking good. Um, I will, when we get this on the press, and I think we'll get this on the press later in the week, I will show you actually us using this mold that you watch us make and all the steps with that. Uh, if you've stuck with me this long, you must be very serious about the mold making process and the uh, ram pressing process. You can feel free to message me with questions if you're in the area 
and you want to be here during the day that I am making a mold, uh, you are welcome to join me once we get past the coronavirus and we don't have to worry about masks because I can't fathom doing this um, with masks, to tell you the truth. I actually have a vent in here too. And I to put a vent in this pottery studio just because of this process, because it does get a bit humid in here. And I just turned it on with all this air getting released out of the mold. So this studio was built, we built this studio just for me. Um, I have a 2,500 square foot studio and I was in the basement of four different houses every time we needed a larger studio or, uh, or needed to move, we built a bigger studio, a bigger studio in the basement of our house. And so after four houses, we decided that we were going to build a commercial studio for me. So 21 years in the basement, I think I paid my dues and I finally have a, this wonderful commercial facility. And this room was specifically designed for um, the mold making process and uh, glaze mixing and that's the only things I do in this room. Oh, and a little bit of spray. So uh, that's it. So we are at 120 pounds and that's where I just let it continue to purge. We're done timing and it will just purge and purge and purge probably for a couple hours until all of this water and whatever else is in here uh, is completely out of the mold. Then I will probably go ahead and purge the bottom a little bit just because it's absorbed water because we had to cast on top of it for the second part. But um, I don't purge a lot. So people say, well, when can you start using the mold? You can start using this mold and put it on the press as soon as you're done purging the second half. You're ready to go. It is cured and ready to go. And that is about everything I could possibly think about sharing with you. I am in the Asheville, North Carolina area, and like I said, if you want to come someday when I am doing this to see this done, uh, let me know and we'll uh, try to get together with each other and do that. I hope this was helpful. I'll try to put some notes in the, uh, in the comments, and I look forward to hearing from you. So this is Sue, Salvatera Pottery. I'm in Weaverville, North Carolina. I'm a production potter. Um, we throw, we slump, and we do a little bit of mold. So, hope you come and visit us. We have a gallery in the front part of our studio that we sell straight out of. We do wholesale, consignment, and retail, and a lot of custom work. So, that's my little bit of advertisement. I will see you when we get this mold running, and we'll see how it works. Thank you for spending so much time with me, and I will see you soon. Thanks. All right, so this is our completed mold, and I just wanted to show you what it looks like on the press. There are the phalanges there that I talked about, that the bolts tie it down, and then there are ones on this side too. And there's the mold that we cast. And here I'll go wide out so you can see the whole press in its setup. That's our ram press right there. And in a minute, Amanda is going to um, show this mold actually work. So, be back shortly. So here's Amanda. She's sticking a clump of clay in to our mold, and up we go. And the stoppers stop. Uh, we can change the stoppers, and the stoppers are what actually is stopping the machine from going up any further. So she put air on the bottom so it would release and now she's putting air on the top to release the top part and that that she's pulling off there is the flaxen. So there's the piece turning out quite nice and the flashing comes off and then you clean off the edges. Um, we'll usually clean off the edges on the second day and uh, add pieces or cut pieces off to make a uh, whatever we're doing with it. So that is it. That is the whole process with the RAM process. And if you have any questions, feel free to message us um, below our comments. Thank you.